Coming up on episode 50 of the Up Full Life podcast. You know, so we're dancing up in the balcony and then the ushers come over and they're like, you're not allowed to dance. And we're like, what do you mean we're not allowed to dance? This is a rock concert, like no dancing allowed in the balcony. And we're like, what? And we just ignore them, you know, they're just ushers, right? You know, and uh, so then they come back with like security, like police, you know, and they escort us out of the building. Oh, okay, right. they kick us out of the show, like eight of us. And they see, all our friends see this happening Right, and so some of them scatter like cockroaches, and some of them get away. But I think like six or eight of us get kicked out of the show, and we're like, "Fuck!" So our friends scoop up all the ticket stubs that are on the ground because they were just ripping stubs and throwing them on the ground. Right? They scoop up all the ticket stubs from from Ticket t- Ticketron or whatever the s- computer service was where we got them, and they slid them through those double glass doors on the side where they come together. Yeah. And we took the stubs and went to the drugstore on the corner, and got some scotch tape taped them back together, perforated them with a safety pin, and we all walked back into the show. We all got back in. Wow. And we missed, like, one song, you know? I'm a bozo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I thought you had a bozo. You recognize it. <laughs> Yes, indeedy. Welcome to the Up for Life podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and this is episode number 50, coming at you live and direct from the Vibe Junkie studio in Oakland, California. Yep, West Coast, Blessed Coast, baby, we back. Episode number 50. Silver Anniversary coming at you, and we're so grateful you are tuning in. Before we dive into episode 50, I want to show some love and give thanks and a deep bow of gratitude to everybody who has empowered and enabled the Up For Life podcast to get this far. And not just the Up For Life podcast, but all the music media endeavors that I am lucky and blessed to enjoy and find my way in this musical universe. So this podcast has been so profoundly rewarding. And really opened up a number of doors for me personally and professionally. And I'm just intensely grateful. And I wanted to start this episode off with just a rundown of, you know, we haven't had any sponsors in the traditional sense, but we've had a lot of friends of the pod that have, you know, really lifted us up and humbly give thanks. I'll start with the good folks that live for live music. LiveForLiveMusic.com, Kunj, Sarah, Andrew, just huge supports of everything I do, and, and of course, writing work enables this podcast to do its thing, and uh, that fact is not lost on me. You can find a lot of my stuff, music, media, journalism, coverage, Live For Live Music, and you can also find some of my work, Urban Music. The Healing of the Nations, herbandmusic.com, big up, M-A, you can check it out, urbanmusic.com, the coalescing of music and cannabis culture. And want to show love to jambase.com, where it all began, labels like Color Red and Jumpsuit and Shaman's Dream, which always, you know, looking my way for different projects, 
Super grateful for that. Wellness collectives like Path to Panacea and the Gnome Co. Management teams like The Regime. And all the artists and musicians and DJs and producers and promoters that, you know, allow me to cover their stuff and, you know, promote their work and just be a part of the whole elixir. And that's not lost on me. So, yeah, shout out to all the podcasts out there doing their thing that inspire me to do my thing. Y'all know who you is. And with that, do want to remind folks it's huge if you could rate or review or subscribe to the up for life podcast on your platform of choice the rating and reviewing is huge on apple podcasts it does a whole lot to steer the algorithms in this direction bringing me new listeners new ears new opportunities to spread the gospel so yeah rate or review the pod up for life podcast on Apple Podcasts, and subscribe to the Up for Life Podcast on your platform of choice. Email me directly with any commentary, suggestions, inspirations, vibrations, constructive criticisms, and the like. Email b.gets at upfullife.com. That's b.getz at u-p-f-u-l-l-i-f-e dot com. And lastly, you can support what I do in music media and culture reporting on Patreon.com. For just a couple dollars a month, you can contribute to Patreon.com backslash UpfulLife. Stickers, music, cool shit over there. And just, you know, support these endeavors. We give thanks. Yes, indeedy. Wouldn't you know, 50 episodes deep, and we're finally going to touch on the mighty GD. And I have the privilege and pleasure and honor of having a conversation with one and only Jay Blakesburg. Legendary photographer from his work with the Grateful Dead and a plethora of other legends But really, he's best known for his work photographing the Grateful Dead, and we get into a whole lot about that. The band, his journey as a photographer, we nerd out on the music, and we talk about some life experiences that we share. We are both members of a particular fraternity with regard to incarceration and the drug war. And of course, we also share membership in the tribe of deadheads. And we're both from New Jersey. And a number of other similarities that we explore in this sprawling conversation. I got to tell you, you know, I grew up looking at Jay's work in Relics Magazine and Rolling Stone. And uh, just seeing... What he was able to do from humble beginnings back east, following his muse and the music. And he's built a a legacy that, you know, will be remembered long after he's gone. And I'll tell you, you know, as I was driving over there, he was kind enough to invite me to his home studio in San Francisco. And I was a little nervous, I gotta admit, but. You know, put on my best Brent Midland t-shirt and headed over the Bay Bridge from Oakland. And I was listening to the GD on the way over and my mind was traveling back in the way back machine. Thinking about all those years growing up, admiring this man's work and his story 
And here I was on his, my way to his home and his studio to talk to him about his journey and the good old Grateful Dead. And it wouldn't be possible if not for dear friend Ira, <clears throat> friend to both Jay and myself. He is the one who connected me with Jay Blakesburg and facilitated this conversation all together. So I don't know how much of a podcast guy Ira is, but I'd like to think he's listening to this one. So Ira, thank you. Thank you for all your support for all the music media stuff I do and for your friendship. And I know Jay feels the same way. So it felt appropriate enough for the ceremonial 50th episode of the Up For Life podcast to finally touch on the Grateful Dead and to do so with such an inspiration for me personally and professionally in Jay Blakesburg. And I'm so touched that he would welcome me into his home and his studio and his lair to chat it up. It's a testament to this thing of ours and this connection between the greatest American songbook and this band beyond description. Because it goes without saying that I would not be who I am today in any way without the Grateful Dead. My half-sister took me to see them back in 92 when I was just a young boy. And, you know, it really just redirected the proverbial gear shift and set me on the golden road to unlimited devotion for the rest of my days. And, you know, it comes in waves. There are times when I play tons of dead, read, watch documentaries, talk online. And then there are extended periods of time where I kind of move away. Or maybe, you know, I listen to a lot more Jerry Garcia band or whatever. Um, but it is omnipresent in just how we move through life, the Grateful Dead. And if you know, you know. And if you don't know, hopefully uh, your curiosity has peaked uh, just enough hearing me discuss uh, this that you'll continue to tune in because Jay's story is not wholly predicated on the Grateful Dead or the Hate Ashbury or the hippie dream, although that certainly is a guiding light and maybe the force of nature in both of our lives. Uh, there's a lot more to it. Uh, like I said, we touch on our experiences uh, behind bars and the war on drugs and and just uh, music media in general in the digital age. There's a whole lot to unpack here, but it does feel just organically right on time to talk Grateful Dead with Jay Blakesburg for the 50th episode of the Upful Life podcast. I am so proud and so honored. Give thanks to everybody who tunes in for the past three years and nearly, you know, I guess over five, 15,000 downloads at this point which small potatoes in the big picture but it's an abundance that i am grateful for so let's get into it the one and only grateful dead photographer legend you're welcome please jay blakesburg <laughs> Well, pinching myself this morning out here in San Francisco, not far from Stern Grove, where I like to come see some shows in the summer, looking around this magnificent studio of the one and only, the great Jay Blakesburg. Thank you for having me over and welcome to the Upful Life podcast. All right, right on B. Thanks for coming to San Francisco, crossing yeah. the Bay Bridge. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny. I was driving out here uh, from my place in Oakland and thinking about you know, the journey of reading Relics Magazine as a teenager, seeing your shots, dreaming of one day, you know, coming out here to live. Uh, and, and just sort of like a, it's a notch today. To, just to come here to meet you, to spend uh, time with you, to have right. a conversation with you uh, is a big deal. Like as a dead fan, as a journalist, and just, you know, as a as a dude, you know. So I want to say thanks. Like it's not you're, just some average shit. This is a big deal to me. Uh, and I'm well, really grateful. You're welcome, and thank you. I appreciate it. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that about relics because 
you know, it's the exact same thing for me, right? So I was reading Relics Magazine cover to cover in the 1970s and uh, looking at these stories about the Haight-Ashbury and the airplane and the dead and all this other stuff. I mean, for a while there at the end of the 70s, Relics sort of veered off and started covering some new wave, as it was called back then. I remember Debbie Harry was on the cover uh, they had the Stones on Mick Jagger on a cover. Um, uh, Blondie was on a cover of Relics, but uh, you know, in the in the seventies, I mean, we read Relics more than we read read Rolling Stone magazine at the time because that's who talked about the Grateful Dead, and it was really the you know Rolling Stone talked about the Grateful Dead, but not every issue. Right. And so you know, as a fifteen and sixteen year old kid looking at these stories and looking at these photographs by legendary photographers like Jim Marshall and Herbie Green and Baron Woolman. And uh, uh, looking at these photos and then learning about people like Chet Helms or Bill Graham or the poster artists Mouse and Kelly and Rick Griffin and Moscoso and Wes Wilson, otherwise known as the Big Five. And, you know, those are the guys that made all those Avalon posters and all those Fillmore posters. Not all of them, but, you know, they were the iconic guys of the time. And all of that shit combined with, you know, reading the electric Kool-Aid acid tests and reading on the road just, you know, opened our minds to the point where we knew, or at least I did, that I needed to get the fuck out of New Jersey, you know, and, and of course, you know, add some psychedelics into the equation and, you know, start dropping acid on snow days when your parents are at work and staring at album covers and listening to The Grateful Dead and, you know, realizing that your heart and your soul should be on the West Coast in San Francisco and not in suburban New Jersey Um, you know, the only missing link was how to fucking figure out how to get out of New Jersey and get to California. Like we just didn't know, like we didn't know, like you don't know people in California, your whole family's from Jersey, your, your people are from New Jersey, your relatives are from New Jersey. You know, you don't know how you can just get to California. It's just not like, okay, I'm going to, just going to go to California. I'm going to live there. Like, you know, it, it takes a, it takes a mighty leap and a lot of inspiration uh, to, to do it. And, um, and those articles and relics and those people that I mentioned was that inspiration to sort of get the ball rolling. I bet, man. I similarly learned all about all that stuff through relics and, and you know, Golden Road and Blair Jackson and, and David Gans and like yourself. And so it's another generation down. And, you know, my half sister took me to see my first show in 92. I was 14. Right. So can't start much earlier than that. Right. And, uh, you know, it's funny because I was listening to you talk on another show and you were saying about how the tour scene wasn't this giant moving circus when you got involved. It was much more of a like low key, tight knit thing. I was wondering if you could maybe like paint the picture of, of when you showed up, what the lot was like, what the general city to city caravan was like in, you know. So when I first, you know, I saw the Grateful Dead in 1977 for the first time. I was 15 years old. I saw the Jerry Garcia band a few months before that in the, in July of 77. And, uh, you know, I didn't really know what it was. I mean, I knew a few songs. I knew Sugary. I knew Truckin'. I knew, you know, a handful of, of, of Grateful Dead sing Grateful Dead bootleg cassettes that I was acquiring from people that I had met at shows in the mail and playing them on the one stereo system in our living room, uh, our TV room at our house and dancing wildly by myself, you know, listening to, you know, Woodstock 69 or whatever the tape was that I had at the moment. And, uh, but by the, by, by, by the spring of 79, um, I would go to shows and we started walking around parking lots and there wasn't a shakedown street. There wasn't a big bazaar of people selling burritos and grilled cheese sandwiches or bottled water or anything else or beer. Uh, there were people tailgating, uh, I would say that most of those people were probably local people. I remember going to a Spectrum Philly show, taking a train down there, not not realizing that there was no trains home to New Jersey when the show was over and, you know, hitching a ride from some people that, you know, we met that maybe knew somebody that we knew that was a friend of an older brother and, you know, dropped us off at the on ramp of the Garden State Parkway. And, you know, rather than them like getting off or actually they did get off that exit because they lived near us. But they, you know, rather than driving us the four minutes down the road, which was a 30 minute walk at three in the morning versus them driving, you know, they just like, okay, get out of here, kids. You know, we were we were 16 or something like that. We didn't drive. We didn't have licenses. Um, But I think that by the time by the time 
the summer of 79 rolled around, I was starting to meet and see people regularly in those parking lots. Uh, some of those people, like there's this guy that, um, uh, his name is Kevin. We call him Edgar because he looked like Edgar Winter. had like super blonde <laughs> white hair. It was his nickname. Uh, and I still see Kevin Joyce is his name. I still see Kevin Joyce at shows on the East Coast and festivals. And, you know, we reconnected, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, ran into each other at some shows and still see each other at shows. And I still consider him my brother. You know, we met in parking lots and dead shows in 79. And, uh, you know, little by little, you'd start seeing more people. And then I, that's when I started to realize that these people were my people. And even though I had my friends in high school, you know, they wanted to drop acid because they could drink a case of beer and not get drunk. But right. I wanted to drop acid because I w- could see God, you know, whatever yeah. manifestation that was. You know, like I, I was that. seeing something a little bit different than, than some of those people. And not to say that there's anything wrong with what they were doing or anything right about what I was doing. We just had a different, you know, impression and experience from those psychedelic drugs. And, uh, you know, those early LSD trips combined with those early Grateful Dead shows made me realize like that was home. Right. And that's, you know, and so then you start going a little bit further and you start traveling, you know, you're not just driving on a train for an, an hour and now you're getting in your car and you're driving two hours or four hours or, you know, my 18th birthday, 12, one we drove eight hours to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to see the Grateful Dead at the Stanley theater, uh, legendary show, yeah. uh, 1130, 79, 12, one There were, you know, there were bootleg tapes of that that were soundboard tapes. Uh, there was this guy, his name was Andre. He was a big Coke dealer. I think Coke fiend, rich kid, um, used to give Dan Healy copious amounts of cocaine and <laughs> plug into the soundboard and make soundboard right. tapes. And he had this giant reel to reel tape deck that looked like a refrigerator. And after one of those shows in Pittsburgh, uh, after the second night, after the December 1st show, we all went back to some sketchy hotel near the venue in Pittsburgh. And there's like 15 or 18 or 20 of us all sitting around on the floor and on the beds. And we have his reel to reel tape deck set up in the middle with um, a bunch of, you know, D fives and other tape decks daisy chained out of it. And we're all making copies of that tape from that show. They played this incredible China rider and CC rider. It's, it's a legendary soundboard tape, 12179, um, Stanley theater, Pittsburgh. And, uh, uh, you know, we're smoking weed and, you know, everybody's dosed to the gills and, you know, our eyeballs are spinning around in our heads and, you know, somebody knocks on the door and we open it up and it's the fucking Pittsburgh police, Ooh. you know, and they see like this tape deck with these giant reels spinning and all these tape decks with all these wires, you know, and this is 1979, like they thought we were fucking undercover narcs, like, you know tapping phones and like, you know, <laughs> like in some like drug sting, you know, they were like uniformed cops, right. you know, and they were just like, uh, okay, keep the noise down you guys. And, you know, and, 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 you know, we had enough drugs on us to all fucking go to prison right. for, for a long time, you know, cause back then in 79, you get caught with anything. You're fucking in up shit's Creek fucking joint, you know, but, uh, you know, crazy shit like that would, would, would go down. And then by, by early 80, um, we were again more, meeting more and more people, and I went to the Capitol Theater shows. They did three shows in the spring of eighty, March, I don't know, thirty, thirty-one, April first. That for April first, nineteen eighty, show was the one where the band was April Fool. So the band came out and they all played different instruments. They played Promise Land, and I think Jerry was on keyboards, and Billy played guitar, and Mickey played bass, <laughs> and uh, you know everybody's playing different stuff, and uh, and. Um, you know, it was at that sh- those shows that I met this guy named BT, which stood for Brother Tom, and and BT uh, was was just starting his fledgling LSD business in in uh, right off the Panhandle here in San Francisco, and and he you know gave me fifty hits of acid, and I dosed all my friends, and at the end of the show he said to me. Um, Hey man, if you want, when I get back to San Francisco next week, I'd be happy to overnight you a few thousand hits of LSD that you could sell to your friends from high school and you can be part of my underground LSD distribution network. (laughs) And I just thought that was the greatest thing I ever heard. So I just gave my parents home address and he started overnighting me 2000 hits at a time. And, and, you know, we were just, we psychedelicized Union County, New Jersey with, you know, massive quantities of blotter acid. And, you know, from there, it just kept getting even more crazy and more people on the road and meeting more people that were like me and like my friends and 
the women I was hanging out with and the guys I was on tour with and, you know, the six people that were in my 69 Chevy Nova driving to dead shows up and down the East Coast or to the Midwest or wherever we were going. Amazing. That's that's a hell of a ride up. I love that. That's and how it all starts, man. It's beautiful. And you know, it's, just it's, like Blue Boy and Dragnet, you know, <laughs> you know, you know that character? You know, yeah, well, I was thinking about Dragnet when you were talking about that hotel scene. Right, yeah. It sounded yeah. like something yeah. out of Dragnet. Those kids taking that crazy LSD <laughs> yeah. and Blue Boy, man, he's well, going down. But that's funny. Yeah. And I wanted to... Uh, obviously, I want to get into LSD and and your journey with that and the legal system. But before that, um, I want to know how the dead came into your life. Like, did somebody bequeath it to you? Did you find it on your own? And also, photography. Did did you find your way to a camera? Or did somebody uh, put one in your hands? Um, so yes, and yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> um, I originally started. There was a kid in my high school who was taking some pictures at some concerts and then he was selling them to us in high school for like a buck a piece, right? Eight by tens. And I thought that was really cool and I had a bunch of them thumbtacked down the wall and then I just sort of wanted to start creating my own photographs. I'm starting to bring my camera to concerts because I wanted to create my own memorabilia. And a lot of those photos, uh, early on I started borrowing uh, my stepbrother's camera and my dad's camera you know, there's the, the, the often told story about my first time shooting The Grateful Dead at the Meadowlands where I borrowed my dad's old Pentex camera and some lenses and he lent a 16-year-old kid his camera to take some photos. But I had taken a few photos leading up to that, some with my dad's camera and some with uh, my, my stepbrother's camera. And um, literally was just doing them and making 8x10s in a darkroom that I built in the basement of my mother's house and... and uh, some tacking them to my wall and giving them to my friends and, you know, selling them to some of my friends for a buck a piece to make money to buy darkroom paper and chemicals and, and, and buy concert tickets. And then I started selling eight by 10 black and white prints in the parking lots at dead shows, you know, tickets were 10 bucks. I'd come back with 60 or 80 bucks in my pocket in dollar bills yeah. selling, you know, selling prints. That was before we started selling acid. Um, uh, you know, to make money to go to more shows, right? Because that's, you know, I think our allowance was probably $5 a week or right. $2 a week. That's what mine was, or, right. You know, something stupid, right? So, um, Were there other cats out in the lots with uh, Prince or yes. were you the guy? No, there were other people out there. That's where I got the idea from. Okay. Yeah, there was, I remember buying a couple of prints at the Philly Spectrum at that show I was mentioning in, in, in 70, 78 or 79. I can't remember when that was. I think it was 78. But I remember buying a couple of eight by tens and five by sevens or one or two prints from this guy and hanging up, up on my wall. Um, but you know, there was different people, but I saw that they were doing that and I was like, oh man, that's a good idea. You know, and I was already taking some photos and so I, you know, I don't know if those photos are any good. I think I took my <laughs> first, I took a, a couple of okay photos at the Meadowlands. There's, there's three or four that I like and, uh, um, that I, are important to me and, and, and still to this day that I would print and, you know, after John Mayer played the wolf guitar at City Field a couple of years ago, um, that do, uh, the night when he played morning do that, that yeah, big do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, a whole nother story. If you want to skip ahead, I'll tell yeah. that story. But um, <laughs> You uh, can or we can get uh, there. So, so I gave John a print of Jerry playing that Wolf guitar in, at that Meadowland show in 78. So it was good enough to make a print to give to John. But, uh, um, you know, uh, what happened was is that, um, uh, you know, Mayor called me and, and said, hey, I know I, I, I think the, t the time has come for me to play Wolf and I know you're the guy that can make it happen because I know – one of my really good friends, a guy named David Meerman Scott, is is sort of the wolf handler. He's best friends with the okay. guy who owns Wolf. And so I just called David, and, and we got the wheels in motion. But um, uh, Matt Bush, Bob Weir's manager, mm -hmm. um, who helps craft set lists for Dead & Go and Bob and everything, um, sort of keeps track of it all. And uh, there's been stories written about Matt and this process. Um, you know, when we kind of locked everything in for City Field, I, I called Matt, and I said, I said, um, and he already knew about the, that Mayor, Mayor was playing it. I said, you know, I really feel like you got to have him play Morning Dew with that guitar. He goes, I'm, you know, I'm way ahead of you. It's already on the set list. You know, um, I've been, you know, I've been 
thinking about that already, he's got to play Morning Dew on that guitar. So it was it was uh, it was set in stone yeah. that that was going to happen because Matt knew how important that day was going to be with Mayor playing playing Wolf. So. Anyway, but I made a print after that show. You know, people give John Mayer stuff all the time. And so I made him a print of that Garcia shot holding, playing Wolf at, at the Meadowlands in 78. And then I made a, a print of John playing Wolf, but not his whole body, just a super close up of his hands on Wolf. Right? Because, you know, people don't want to hang pictures of themselves, you know, like, right. you know, like John Mayer. And, uh, and, and he said to me, he goes, oh my God, he goes, uh, you know, people give me stuff all the time and I just don't know what to do with it. You know, like I don't have room on my walls. I don't, you know, I don't know what to do with all, all this stuff. But he's like, the minute I saw those, he goes, I sent them out to the framer immediately and they're both framed and hanging in my house. Um, so it was important to John as well that he got to play that guitar. Yeah, it was a legendary night and a, definitely a ceremonial thing and a, appropriate for you to be not only a photographer, but a facilitator. And who to think that the kid that took his dad's camera to the Meadowlands is now arranging... Right, somehow was yeah. able to like facilitate that whole thing, yeah. It's a, um, yeah, it's cool. And, and John was John is very grateful and John is an incredible human being and, and I love him dearly and I think he's... He's fabulous in the band. I think that he's got the right energy, the right vibe. He gets it. Um, you know, it was a, it's been an interesting, you know, six year journey, seven year journey now with uh, with Dead and Co. Yeah. I guess it's six years, right? Twenty fifteen. Right. So um, uh, John is really coming to his own in a big way, and and has embraced it. And I'm proud of him, and I'm proud of that band for what they've done with that music. Yeah. They, and I'm proud that we're all still there to see it all and experience yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, that's an important part of it. And yeah. obviously, you never know these, especially nowadays, and you've got to savor what we have and, and enjoy it while it's here. And yeah, kudos to, to the whole, you know, Grateful Dead family for, you know, soldiering on. And lots of people who had never been old enough to experience the magic and the sort of traditions now get to revel in it you know it's, it's turned over to a whole nother quarter yeah. century generation and, and it's how ha- and it's been going on f- since jerry died really uh i mean it's it's you know the grateful dead are bigger now than they've ever been before i mean look at the sellouts at, at dead and co and phil yeah. shows and 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 all that but you know even in between all the stuff that mickey and billy were doing and the seven walker stuff that billy did and the stuff that mickey did with all of his different incarnations right. and 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 the de- you know the rhythm devil stuff that they did and then uh you know, Bobby with Rat Dog, of course. But, you know, what what's interesting is that, um, you know, 25 years later, the music of this band and this particular scene is still so relevant and so important because it survived so many cultural shifts in our landscape of pop culture from when the band started in 65 to the summer of love, to the early seventies, to their switch from this full on psychedelic and improv band, blues band to this, um, Americana band, working man's dead, American beauty. Um, you know, they made records at the height of the disco movement when everybody, when disco was all the rage in this country, but through it all, they didn't really have hit songs. Yeah. They had songs on the radio here and there, but they didn't have hit songs, but they're still playing arenas. They're still selling out rooms that were anywhere from 2,000 people to 20,000 people to 50,000 person stadiums. You know, Watkins Glen in 73, 600,000 people for the Grateful Dead, the Allman Brothers and the band. Right. You know, if you look at this band, and so here we are in 2021, this band that never really was like a, they were never the Rolling Stones. They were never had the radio muscle that the Beatles or the Stones or Paul McCartney or you know, Pink Floyd or any of these bands are. And this band is playing stadiums. Right. I mean, it's mind boggling. It just goes to show you how important this music is and how important this songbook is and how they've reinvented and reinterpreted these songs over and over again in all these different incarnations, starting with Jerry Garcia as a 
you know, listen to them in, in 65 and 66 versus 68 and 69 versus 70 and sure. 71 versus 73 to 77 versus the, you know, the, the, the early Brent years, you know, versus the mid late Brent years versus the end of Brent versus, you know, Vince versus right. um, Rat Dog and Phil and Friends and, and, and the list goes on and look at the evolution of this songbook and it's right. mind boggling. And, you know, when Hunter died a few years ago and, and there were all these, you know, posts being made on social media and there was that one thing that said, these are all the songs that Robert Hunter has written, you know, and you're looking at these songs Staggling. and you're like, this is the soundtrack of our lives. And this is like some of the greatest rock and roll poetry that has ever been written. And even Bob Dylan would admit that. And even Paul McCartney and, you know, yeah. anybody else who's living or dead, you know. And, and listen, I'm not saying Robert Hunter is the greatest songwriter that ever lived. I'm just saying he's the greatest songwriter that ever lived because he <laughs> might very well might be, you know, yeah. I mean, his words are unbelievable. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, the story he wrote, what to lay me down, broke down palace and ripple. Was it all on the same day in, like, in, in, in London, in, in London, yeah, and yeah. like in one afternoon, like yeah. think about that. Yep. Think about those songs. And I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. So this band has persevered in ways that other rock and roll hasn't. And, um, and, and it's been so, um, fulfilling on so many levels for so many people. And, uh, I, you know, we all joke, you know, you know, the earth has been around for 5 billion years or whatever it is, 500 million. I don't know the number, you know, but we're lucky enough to be alive in the time of Jerry Garcia. Right. You know? Like, I mean, it's just, it's classic. It it's really classic. Is. That, you know, that we get to experience it. And for those of us who have tapped into that and had those experiences, our lives are richer for it. Our lives are better for it. And it's 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 um, it's been the most incredible ride. And like we talked about earlier, it all started by picking up fucking Relics magazine yep. or listening to a bootleg tape that somebody gave you or dropping a needle on a record that your older brother or sister loaned you or, or your neighbor, in my case, this guy named Lozzie, who was two years older than me, bring over records and be like, you got to listen to this. You know, he was the guy that turned me on to this stuff, you know. That's so cool. Um, and so, you know, he wanted to corrupt my little mind, and he did. And look at where look at where it's gotten me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's funny, because uh, my, my half-sister, same thing. I was like, you know, Metallica, Motley Crue, you know, 13 years old, real adrenaline, aggressive music, playing mm -hmm. sports, surfing. Mm -hmm. She was like, you know what? She used the Steely and the Skull, which, you know, kind of, if you don't know, could be some metal, heavy metal imagery. Check this out. Come see this band with me. And, you know, the rest is history. And I was, what you were talking about with your journey is like that experience, going to the show or getting the record, reshaped your whole trajectory. Mine too. Like, who would I have been where professionally, personally, socially, geographically, if I didn't catch wind and get on the bus? And everything I do from the people I hang out with to the work I do to the music I love started you know, with the dead and really all things Garcia. So it's interesting to hear somebody with your, with your experience. You know where you'd be? You'd be eating pop tarts for breakfast instead of that organic granola you have every morning. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably back in Jersey, you know, yeah. you know the mortgage and, and right. a job I hate. 2.3 children. <laughs> yeah. But here I am, you know, and I've, I've had uh, quite a ride, not your ride, but certainly something that is in, in the same sort of ethos of, seat of the pants, where does the music take me, how do I make it work for me? Yeah. So you are a real, you know, shining example of, of that clicking and, and you making the most of it. But you, you knocked off a bunch of eras, sort of signposts of the dead's career. So I'm curious, you know, because you got there and you said 77 was 77, the first show? yeah. And really, like, started hitting it hard a year or two later. What is your sweet spot gd wise in terms of era if you're reaching for you yeah. mean from what i saw or the Just whole era so you know Both. how about uh, there's whole era and okay you saw. so i i became aware of the grateful dead in 76 uh, my buddy nikki katsanis and an older brother dennis who was a big deadhead and he went to those capital theater shows in 76 i remember nikki saying to me we got to go see the grateful dead before they break up um you know kind of funny right um, and, uh, so I became aware of them and listened to a little bit of it. I probably, my first record was probably, you know, Skull and Roses, you know, which just came out on, on, uh, vinyl, um, uh, you know, 50th anniversary. Um, so, uh, sweet spots for me from when I saw the band, 
I mean, I saw them in 77, and of course, 77 is epic and legendary on many, many levels, and everybody talks about Cornell. You know, I just listened to English Town 77 yesterday. That was my first Grateful Dead concert, right? Wow. And, it, and, and I have a friend who was also his, too. Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. So many deadheads on the East Coast. English Town was a first. Uh, you know, there was a kid I went to grammar school, or kindergarten through fifth grade, and then I moved away to a different town 20, 30 miles away. Uh, we lost touch until we, he, we reconnected in the early 2000s in Boulder. English Town was his first show also. You know, we we left in, when we were 10 years old. We separated and we both came back five years later to English Town, six years, five years later to English Town and now we're friends and we're in touch and he lives in Boulder, a guy named Mark Gershman, you know. Um, one of those weird, funny things that happens yeah. in life with, with that. But, Particularly um, in this community yeah. that happens. But uh, if you haven't listened to it, it's Dick's Picks. I believe it's number 15. And... Um, Go listen to, well, besides many stellar moments, the Truckin' and the Eyes of the World and the Terrapin Encore and whatnot, the He's Gone, Not Fade Away, which is almost 40 minutes long, is, in my opinion, one of the most hair-raising on your neck and arms, goosebumps down your back and arms jams that you will ever listen to. He's gone, not fade away. It is unfucking real. And I was too young and unaware to know, realize what was going on in that moment. I mean, I remember it and it's jammy and whatnot, but like going back and listen, like, you know, within, within a year. So it was also a live radio broadcast on WNEW, but they didn't broadcast the Encore Terrapin. So until it came out as a Dick's Picks, nobody had Terrapin, oh, wow. except for some of the bootleg audience tapes. But the soundboard tape which, you know, we used to record those off the radio with a tape deck. You'd yeah. listen to it and record, and that was your soundboard tape, right? It was a radio broadcast. And, uh, I mean, I probably listened to that cassette. Well, I probably burned through three or four copies of that cassette over the years because it was just such an incredible show, and I probably started listening to that. You know, within several months of going to that show, we were listening to that regularly, and I, it grew and grew and grew on you because... You know, when you're, it was your first show and you're like, you sure. knew a couple of songs and, you know, whatnot. You, you don't know. You're 15 years old. You don't know what's up. Um, so, of course, yeah, the 77 era. But 80 is when I toured hard, summer of 80. Um, we were a year and a few months into the Brent Midland era. They had been rehearsing. They were breaking out all sorts of stuff at the end of 79, early 80 that they hadn't played in a long time. The Wheel, Uncle John's Band. You know, like in, in 78, and early 79, I think they played Uncle John's Band maybe only two, three, four times. You can go into the dead base and look it up. And then all of a sudden, and, uh, I think it's 12, 26, 79, my first New Year's show, of New Year's Run, uh, mm -hmm. Five Nights in Oakland. Uh, they did an Uncle John's Band that was stellar, and it just remained in the set list with Brent, you know. And Come here, Uncle John's Band, by the riverside. And uh, The Wheel came back and, and China Doll and To Lay Me Down and Broke Down Palace. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot, they've started playing more than just like, they you know, rather than closing with either Black Peter, Warfrat or Stella Blue, um, as the, the Garcia ballad, they started working in Comes a Time and, and, and um, you know, China Doll and more Morning Dews into that slot. And so Brent really infused a lot of really good energy into the band in that uh, uh, spring of 79 and then by summer of 80, which is when I saw the Grateful Dead from Maine to Florida, San Diego to Alaska, and everywhere in between, uh, they were on fire. So for me, 80 was a big year. And then um, uh, things got wonky for me. I got arrested in 81. Um, 87 was a big, important year for me and my trajectory. 
you know, years that I love, I love listening to that stuff from 68 and 69. I just think yeah. that, you know, like that Fillmore box set they released a dozen years ago, maybe. Garcia on the SD. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, that, that Fillmore, Fillmore West, Fillmore East, Fillmore West, I guess it is. I don't know. Uh, maybe both. I can't think, I can't remember off the top of my head, but those shows are, I think it's somewhere on the West coast. Unbelievable. Like listening to those CDs re-inspired me to listen to that era of the Grateful Dead and realize how incredible, because they were rehearsing all the time, like those other ones and those dark star yeah. jams, those morning dues were just unbelievable. Uh, you know, when they started playing weather report suite and eyes of the world yes. and all the wake of the flood stuff, here comes sunshine and seven, you know, and I loved, of course, working man's dead and, 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 uh, uh, American beauty, but, but, um, you know, by, by, uh, and I know everybody loved Europe 72 and I did also, but for me, wake of the flood was a more yeah. important record. Um, so 73, that era, you know, if you think about it and you went back and looked at like the billboard pop charts, you'd probably see like Helen Reddy and Barry Manilow and, you know, <laughs> right. Cher and, you know, stuff like that. And on the pop charts, I don't even know, I'm just spitting out names, right? You know, two and three minute little pop ditties that were, you know, feeding the end of AM radio into the, the beginning of FM radio. I mean, FM was, came about a little bit before that, obviously, but, uh, and then, you know, you got Weather Report Suite, which is, what, 13 yeah. minutes long on the record or something like that. And you're like, like, who are these guys and what are they thinking? And, you know, that that Weather Report Suite, I mean, that that whole, you know, that whole section of music is incredible. And those it's lyrics and Barlow and Weir and... Like the desert's made, lover comes and spreads her wings. You know, and then of course you roll into Mars Hotel and you get Scarlet Begonias and um, Unbroken. Um, Unbroken and there's Black Throated Wind on Mars Hotel. I can't remember. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, I mean, sure. what a song. I mean, you know, yeah. again, just, you know, the lyrics and Barlow and Weir and, you know, but again, you know, Scarlet Begonias, Hunter, Garcia. I mean, you know, so I love that 73, 74 yeah. era. Um, you know, 75 was a, was a year off. They made Blues for Allo. It was a little bit more out there. Um, you know, I, I love it, you know, at the time I wasn't aware of it, but, uh, you know, 76 live where there's some great stuff when they came back from the hiatus. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, um, of course we get to the 77, you know, spring tour and, and, uh, you know, rolling all the way into English town. And again, it was legendary and epic, you know, yes. so there's so many great eras. Yeah. Like I really love all of those. I love that 69. I love that 73, 74. I love that 77. I love that 80. I love that 87, you know, so there's all of that stuff is, um, is, uh, is just really incredible. All right. I would concur, uh, with regard to the different sweet spots in different eras. And, and so Two From the Vault was the first like live dead cassette that I got. Right. Was that the 68, 68 the carousel, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. It's a combination from film wars, some carousel. It's like, right. A, but also the one from the vault. That's my fave. All time. Is, 75. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, and so. To uh, go into that room, the first time I ever went into Great American, right. I just like. And you're like, the moment. Grateful Dead <laughs> yes, played here. Yes. Like, what the fuck? The Grateful yes. Dead played here. And they just play. They played this. I mean, I've been in that room like hundreds of times. And every time I yeah. walk in there, I'm like, the Grateful Dead played here. Like, yeah. can you even imagine? Yeah. You know, unbelievable. Beautiful room. Agreed. And yeah. One of the one of the best in, in the city for sure. Yeah. But uh, so seventy three I would say like traditionally I would say like fall seventy three, like before the the wall of sound, like at, with Wake and all those great like uh Let It Grows, Weather Part Sweets from Fall seventy three until I got older. Around thirty five I became like crazy about Brent. I'm actually wearing my tons of steel shirt. Nice. Um, so I really love that early '80s pocket. Now I don't hit '80 as much as I maybe '81 or '82, and uh, uh, something about like just the aggression and uh, like sort of like rock. They're just like coming out of that re very pretty, serene late '70s. It's just kind of it's like a hurricane of Brent yeah. and, and energy. And I don't know when I was younger, it sounded different to me I, I couldn't click with it but now when i'm reaching for something it's usually early 80s and i love the 
New Year's run that you right when you got out of jail, I've heard you on a different show where you talked about you went right into the New Year's run of eighty three. Right. Yeah. And that's kinda like my cutoff from right. that sweet spot. Yeah, go back rooms. and listen to like the summer tour, uh the August tour of, of eighty. Go yeah. listen to like the Uptown Theater shows in Chicago, August of eighty. I think it's like maybe sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, fifteen. Are they 16. doing an opening acoustic set in no, the, around then? No, so it's not. It's not the reckoning. No, era. No, that started the the, the October. That was uh, September of the so, Warfield. Right. Actually, today that we're the day we're recording this on. This is a anniversary show, October eleventh, nineteen eighty, at the Warfield three set show, right. acoustic and electric. I don't remember what they played, but I have uh, pictures from this day. You know, 41 years ago, I'll post them later today. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, so... Uh, I'll listen to that on the way yeah, home. Yeah, but, so, but those Uptown shows are great. Um, the Cleveland Music Hall in August of 80. That was a great tour in 80. Um, uh, if you've never listened to Lewiston, Maine, 9680. I have, yeah. You know, that's a legendary show. Yeah. And, um, I had that on cassette. And, yeah. yeah, and, and uh, there's no soundboard tape up. But I asked David Lemieux like five years ago, why isn't Lewiston, Maine, 1980, a Dick's Picks or a Day's Picks? He goes, we don't have a soundboard tape of it. And, and I posted that on social media uh, last month. I posted photos from that day on the 6th, and I mentioned that in my story. And um, a bunch of people said, no, there's soundboards of it. Here's one on the archive. And I listened to it, and I, I don't think they're soundboards. I think they're, I think they're really good audience tapes, I, you know. But uh, unfortunately, but that's a great show, 9-6, 1980, last show of that summer tour. And then they took a couple of weeks off, and they came back and started the Warfield, which I think was 9-25, 80 was the first one. Uh, from that 15 night run, and they so I went to six of those shows, and then I went to both New Orleans shows at the Sanger Theater. Wow, um, did they do the three yeah, setters yeah, yeah. there? Yeah, do two tapes shows. exist? What's that? Do tapes exist? Uh, they shows? must, I'm sure. I got because they multi track. I've all seen that a stuff. bunch of shows at the Sanger. Oh, uh, me too. So, so you know, the Sanger, you know, they have side doors and front doors. Oh, yeah, so we're at the Sanger one night, and we're all up in the balcony, and we're all dancing. Well, first of all, I had a D5, one of those little Sony D5 tape decks. And, uh, and I used to just hand it to my taper friends because I was dancing and dropping acid and, or taking pictures. So I would let people tape with my deck and then just, you know, end up with these master tapes, but, um, uh, which I gave away years ago and now I regret. But uh, anyway, um, uh, somebody in the balcony had a tape deck under the seat and some lady sitting next to it was like freaked out and thought it was a bomb. Right, she wasn't. She wasn't a deadhead, so she called security, and they came and found it and threw the guy out. And you know, so we're dancing up in the balcony, and then the ushers come over and they're like, "You're not allowed to dance." And we're like, "What do you mean we're not allowed to dance? This is a rock concert. Like, no dancing allowed in the balcony." And we're like, "What?" And we just ignore them. You know, they're just ushers, right? You know, and uh, so then they come back with like security, like police, you know, and they escort us out of the building. Oh, okay, my. they kick us out of the show, like eight of us, and they see all our friends see this happening. Right, and so some of them scatter like cockroaches, and some of them get away. But I think like six or eight of us get kicked out of the show, and we're like, "Fuck!" So our friends scoop up all the ticket stubs that are on the ground because they were just ripping stubs and throwing them on the ground. Right? They scoop up all the ticket stubs from from Ticket t- Ticketron or whatever the s- computer service was where we got them, and they slid them through those double glass doors on the side where they come together. Yeah. And we took the stubs and went to the drugstore on the corner, got some scotch tape taped them back together, perforated them with a safety pin, and we all walked back into the show. We all got back in. Wow. We missed, like, one song, you know. That's but we weren't allowed to dance at fucking the Sanger Theater in New Orleans. Orleans yeah, I know, right? You know, That's no a dancing. funny story. So I have no pictures of the band on stage from the, those shows. I just have some a couple pictures from Bourbon Street and the, and the Marquee, but I have, like, no pictures from New Orleans. And then they played Eight Nights at Radio City Music Hall, right. and... Uh, and we were just out dancing in the lobby the whole time. I have no pictures in Radio City either because I shot a bunch of I shot six of the Warfield shows. And I'm like, I don't need any more pictures, you know. Like, yeah. who knew? Like, 40 years later, I'd be like, why didn't I shoot pictures of the fucking Grateful Dead in New Orleans and 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 Radio City? But we were just like, you know, we were we were at Radio City. We were doing a lot of fucking blow and dropping a lot of acid, and we were a fucking hot mess. And, right. And. Uh, um, it's the furthest thing from your mind. Yeah, and and it was you know we were just dancing and and those shows at the Warfield and Radio City was the first time the band put speakers in the hallways and let the for the spinners in, for, for the well we right. we weren't spinners back then okay the spinners didn't come until the late eighties with Joseph the cult leader okay you know that's a whole separate thing oh we got to get into oh that the spinners too. is a cult yeah it was a Grateful Dead cult inside our other. Grateful Dead cult <laughs> yeah no they're dancers and they're spinners okay. yeah the spinners are like mid eighty. 86, 87 is about when they came about. Pre-Touch Explosion or with Touch Explosion? Pre, I want to say. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting to hear because I, I guess I kind of, because I don't I don't necessarily dance in the halls, but I am a like in another world dance guy. You know, like, right. you, you can't communicate with me kind of thing. I'm just, right. 
I remember some of my earliest shows, like Spectrum or Nassau Coliseum. Right. The 15-year-old me navigating, trying to go pee or go get a soda and having to weave in and out of these people in like these deep meditations and spinning. And you right. And there, a lot of near misses, a lot of oh, yeah. ducks and weaves and stuff. And it was a real eye-opener. Just, just seeing people, whether it's some cult thing or an acid thing, just right. young me. Witnessing people so entranced right, right, by this yeah. had a very powerful. Did you ever read this me. book, Heads: A Biography of Psychedelic America by Jesse yes. Jarnell? So Jesse, Jesse Jarnell's a hero to me, like you're here. <laughs> yeah, he's a good friend of mine. Love yeah. Jesse. I mean, the Grateful Podcast. Of good course, is the, is, Deadcast. Yeah, it is actually. And I've never heard your podcast, oh, so I'm sorry. I'll listen to it. Not now. even close. Um, uh, <laughs> Jesse's podcast level. is like, yeah, it's it, it is unbelievable. Yep. But um, he talks about Joseph and the spinners in his book. Right. Right. And use one of my photos that I have of Joseph in the hallways, right. you know, with the spinner. So that's a whole nother story that I don't really know a lot about, but Joseph ended up getting arrested, I believe, and had some run-ins with the law. And it was like, I, I don't know all the ins and outs and I'm probably speaking at a turn, but I well, believe there was like a celibacy thing, but of course the cult leader yeah. always is having sex with everybody. You know? I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if I heard that second hand, third hand, if it's true, it's not true. But, um, you know, they were very, the spinners were part of that cult with this guy, Joseph, um, and you can read about it in yeah. Jesse's book, Heads, a biography of psychedelic America. So, um, I've had the experience with the Twelve Tribes cult, uh, right? You know, on the bu- the bus, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. I've I've gone on their bus. Yeah, same. Before I knew better, up at Brett I went and on Puppet the bus to take pictures uh, when they in the 2009 tour, uh, uh, the, the, de- dead the, tour. the dead in 2009. They were parked outside of Madison Square Garden recruiting, and oh, I yeah. went on the bus to take some pictures and sort of grill them a little bit because I'm like very. You know, like I'm anti-cultish, even though I always joke too. like when people are like, what do you mean you didn't get into fish? I'm like, listen, I was already a member of one cult. I couldn't join another. You right. know, when Jerry was still alive, I couldn't go see fish in the early days because you can't be a member of two cults. Well, that's on the uh, list too. We right. You know, that. well, that's kind of a joke. Yeah. You know, like I wish that I got into fish. A li- you know, I saw them for the first time in 93, but I wish that I, I wish that I tapped into that because I think it's incredible. So, yeah, I but, mean. I, I'm of the opinion that it is, or at least it was for a long time, and, and this summer proved that it still can be. Yeah. But I wanted to ask, before we get into the changing of the guard and the here and now, um, really interesting to hear you talk about how you prioritized the hang, the dance, the fun in those early days, like in 1980, when like in retrospect you could have shot some important shit, but you were like, no, I want to dance, or you didn't right. even think. Or, I shot, or I shot just deadheads. Or you shot, which in itself from an anthropo Apology standpoint is also important too. Right. I mean, just looking at the evolution of the culture and right. When uh, people ask me what I do, I say I'm a visual anthropologist. That's an apt description, I yeah. would say. It's I mean, I, you know, I've been documenting this tribe that started here in San Francisco in 1964, right? The, right. The birth of the modern day hippie movement, right? The corner of Haight and Ashbury, right? Essentially, like the... and uh, and I started photographing it 15 years later in 1979, and I've been photographing it for you know 40 something years now, 42 years, you know, and so I consider this tribe an important tribe. I f- I, f- I find this tribe intriguing. I find it um, important. I think that there's a lot of things to learn from our tribe. Um, the tribe has evolved like any tribe. I mean, it's it's everything that right. an anthropologist does if they go into the Amazon in South America <laughs> and just, and discovers a tribe that's yeah. only been around for 20 years or 30 years, but this was maybe 70 years ago, right? Sure. You know, this new tribe spun off and went and lived by this waterfall and started this community and blah, you know. I mean, again, I'm just talking out of my ass here a little bit, but essentially... You can draw a line from one to the other. You know, yeah. So, I mean, you know, we are a tribe and we are an important tribe and we've done important things and, uh, you know, you can listen to Mickey Hart talk about it, the, you know, the bliss and the ecstasy and, and the Joseph Campbell angle. And, you know, there are all these different things that, I mean, there's been worship with this band, unfortunately, right, in weird ways. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And, you know, Garcia just was a guy who wanted to play guitar. He didn't want yeah. to be a fucking rock god. You know, and and we use that that term rock god lightly and, yeah, and tongue in cheek often oftentimes. You know, Clapton, rock god. You know, Keith Richards, rock god. You know, John Lennon. You know what I mean? Whatever, who, whoever, Jerry Garcia. What a rock god. You know, yeah. but but Captain some people Trips. take that further. <laughs> sure. You know, like you know the spinners or people that feel like you know they're the you know Hunter's lyrics and Garcia's playing and the Grateful Dead's music is the word of God right. or a god, and and so. Um, you know, I don't subscribe to that personally. 
Uh, but I do believe in the magic and the spiritual side of it because I believe that those words are very spiritual yeah. and I believe some of those words are words to live by. And, um, and you can find a lot of those things in those lyrics by Hunter and Barlow and you can take them to heart and you can use them as a guide for your life and a roadmap for your life in a lot of ways yeah. um, because I think they are important um, stories you know, oral history of humankind. Yeah. And that's what we are as this tribe. We're just, you know, I mean, visual anthropology, you know, anthropology is, kind, is defined as the study of humankind. Right. Right. And so we are part of that and we are this weird, unique little group of misfits that blossomed out of this band, essentially, yeah. that came out of this scene in the psychedelic 60s, right? You know, pre-Summer of Love, you know, three, four years before the quote-unquote Summer of Love, um, you know, 64, 65, and, and even a year or two before that when Keezy and Hunter and David Nelson were down right. at Stanford dropping acid for the fucking government and the genie really was let out of the bottle and, and the pranksters got in a bus before, long before the Summer of Love oh, and, yeah. and changed people's names and drove across country and... And, and, and blue minds of the American population, yeah. right? So this is all, you know, we're getting close to, you know, 60 years now. Yeah, it's, it's hard to believe, but it, it's been that long. And there was another outpost in, like, uh, upstate New York, too, right? Sort of like... Millbrook. Right. Yeah. So you had it going on both coasts. Right. But it was this underground counterculture thing. Yeah. Really till the Time Magazine article... In 67. Life, and Life Magazine and all that or stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Millbrook thing, you know, with Leary, which also happened around that same period, 60, 65, 66, 67. I don't know exactly the years. I know it was still going on in 67. Um, but, uh, and I need to go find that biography by Art Klepp on Millbrook. I really want to read it actually now because I've been doing a bunch of projects that have involved some Millbrook stuff lately. But, um, and again, I don't know my exact dates um, but I feel like Leary and and um, uh, Richard Albert later yeah. to become Ram Dass. I believe that their experiments with LSD at Harvard were fifty nine and sixty, fifty eight, fifty nine, sixty in that range. So even predates the CIA experiments at Stanford right. with Kesey and Hunter and those guys by maybe a year or two. And of course, we all know there was. You know, CIA experiments MK with LSD, Ultra. yeah, right. MK Ultra, and all that stuff that was even in the even before that in the fifties. Right. You know, so um, but you know, essentially the genie was out of the bottle between you know Leary and Ram Dass and 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 Kesey and Hunter and and you know between those people forward thinking individuals on our planet, you yeah. know those people. Uh, that's when the genie was really let out of the bottle and, and, it, and people, you know, wanted to figure out how to synthesize it. And of course you get into the Owsley years and, and, uh, you know, his whole operation and, you know, the millions of LSD hits that he gave away and the millions of hits that he sold to finance the wall of sound and the grateful dead. And, you know, it goes on and on. So it's all interconnected. Right. And it's all the history is deep, and it's it, fucking cool. It's amazing, and it's so many layers, and there's so you know the the sort of like extrapolation in different directions and cultures that have come out of it, and so many things that I want to touch on with that. Uh, one is when you started uh, getting the sheets in the mail after you met the homie on at the Dead Show. BT Brother Tom. Right? Did you did you have a a grasp on this lineage? Did you understand what oh, we're discussing? Oh, absolutely. You know, so you so you knew it wasn't just you understood the lineage here, like yes, how important yeah, and like serious. we felt like we felt like it was our job duty, and right. our responsibility and our duty, yeah, to blow the minds of America and change people to make them more like us. Like we truly believe that we were psychedelic outlaws on a mission from God to quote the blues brothers, you know, yeah. I mean, we absolutely fucking lutely, you know, like, I mean, it was not just, yes, there was money involved and yes, we were doing this because it fueled our um, ability to jump on airplanes and go see dead shows and stuff like that. But um, we, you know, I was not that guy selling single hits in the parking lot. Right. You know, I was getting thousands of hits sent to me and then I was selling 500 to my friend down the Jersey Shore and 500 to my friend here and 500 to my friend there. And I had, you know, four or six or eight customers who would buy 500 or 1,000 hits. And, you know, I'd buy them for 50 cents and I'd sell them for a dollar, right? So you buy a sheet of acid for $50, you sell it for 100 
hundred hits, hundred dollars, and then they would, and then they would sell either um, uh, quarter sheets or whatever for you know until they got to a three dollar right. individual hit, which is what it was back then, right? So um, you know, we I, I was not in parking lots doing that risky behavior. Right. I was doing other risky behavior, getting stuff overnighted to me, and 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 uh, you know. I was fairly flamboyant just in the terms of what I looked like, you know, like I yeah. wasn't trying to blend in um, because I didn't realize that, you know, shiny, shiny black FBI shoes, you know, that I, you know, like right. I dressed in all purple and orange and had long hair and, you know, it was very, I was probably stupid. I was 18. Yeah. You know, I was, I was a fucking kid. You didn't know and you were caught right. up and you also, again, right. We thought we, were, that, we thought we were invincible. Right. And you also thought you were changing the world. You felt like you had a duty from, you know, creator, spirit, whatever, to spread the sacrament. I understand that. And I just find it, you know, kind of funny to think, you know, you at wide eyed 18, just like out there catching packages in the mail, meeting up in hotel rooms and stuff. And, and, well, and there like, were people like that. So I wasn't doing that. But like, I got a good friend named Borden Barrows who flew up to Rochester. We were living together in the Jersey Shore in like a, uh, there's a town called Belmar. Sure. And it's like a, it's a beach community. Yeah. So all the houses are empty in the winter, right? right? Rows and rows of houses along the beach are empty. So we rented this house for $500 a month. And he had this, um, I was selling these red ganjas. That's what BT made. And eventually they became rainbow ganjas. And, and Borden was selling this um, LSD called Tetragrammaton. <laughs> um, and which were also made here in San Francisco. Uh, I believe the Hayes Street, Hayes Street family back then was responsible for those. And uh, uh, Borden flew up to Rochester on a commuter flight, you know, People Express, you know, $19 one way, and walked into a hotel room to sell this guy 10,000 hits, and it was the fucking DEA, because yeah. the guy he was selling it to got busted and ratted Borden out, and, you know, and Borden got sent, Borden spent three years in jail for that. Um, uh, you know, luckily it was pre-drug wars and, right. and pre, pre-war pre on drugs, rather. Pre-mandatory minimums. Pre-mandatory minimums. Right. You know, otherwise, he would have spent 20 years in prison. The right. same thing for me. I got arrested with 1,800 hits of LSD. And because it was pre-war on drugs, you know, Reagan was already in office, but it hadn't been enacted in the mandatory yeah. minimums and based on the weight of the paper and all that stuff. I mean, I was very fortunate. I got sentenced to five years in state prison and I actually only did eight months. Um, uh, for a variety of reasons, but you know, I know people that got arrested with less LSD than I did just a few years later that spent 15, 17, 20 years in jail. Yeah, and there's also people that I know that got arrested with tens of thousands of hits and were responsible for selling millions of hits and they did 20 years in prison. But you know, that's that's maybe a little bit more realistic than you know, somebody like Timothy Tyler, he's the guy that Obama um commuted, uh, commuted you know, yeah. at the end of his term and he's been out for you know, now it's five years. And, uh, you know, Timothy got caught up in some things and did some really stupid stuff. And But he wasn't like a big, giant, acid guru dude. He was right. a deadhead in a parking lot, you know. And he yeah. did, I don't know, 20 years, 22 years, 24 years, something crazy. You know, changed his whole life, you sure. know. And, and, and if I had gone to jail for 15 or 20 years, I would have never been Jay Blakesburg. We would have never been doing this podcast. I would have never created the body of work that I've created. I would have never documented what I documented. Um, you know, I'd probably be selling insurance, you know, at, you know, and having some job that I hated, yeah. and, you know, who knows? Like, it's hard to say what would have happened, right? Um, uh, maybe that's an over, over, no, you know, it but depends. if you spent that crucial time away, you didn't get to go on the adventure, make the relationships, who knows? Right. But I know I would not yeah. be me. I know yeah. I would not be Jay Blakesburg as you know me or, right. you know, or whatever. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it saddens me to see that and to see what happened to a lot of these people with the war on drugs yeah. and the Reagans and, you know, Nancy fucking, you know, just, just say no bullshit motherfucking <laughs> crap that you know is a crock of shit and has done nothing but ruin a lot of people's lives yeah. especially for a lot of non-violent offenders and especially for a lot of people who were in the lsd trade who truly believe in the therapeutic and spiritual nature of the yeah. sacrament as you called it earlier um you know and again now you have you know people writing books that are bestseller yeah, michael pollen yeah michael pollen and and and, and waldman and and whatnot and uh you know these these books that are on the bestseller list of, of the New York Times, you know, book section that are that are essentially um, uh, books about t- taking LSD. Right. You know, did you, did you did you watch Saturday Night Live the other night? The, there was an LSD skit in there. Oh, I have to get on it's that. It's fucking hilarious. That's where we're at now with it. Yeah. Which is fine. And I, you know, I did time for cannabis and similar 
situation now you see it in the Apple store is the it, dispensary and, and like you yeah. know, they put me How in jail much time for that. Are you in jail for? They sentenced me to two years, I got out in one. Okay. Um but I was I, I another like I said fraternity and parallel between the journeys and stuff. It happened to me later in life. Uh-huh. It's also like a severe humbling and, and something that was in retrospect good for me. Sure. It's maybe not living the right way and right. priorities out of whack. And were you were you arrested with hundreds of pounds of pot or yes, something? Right. And hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was a sting. They got me coming out of a post office, not unlike you, right? With sixty k in an envelope, right? And it was old hat by then, so right. I was not like uh, I, I was on my way somewhere else, and I was stopping by the post office to get something. It wasn't. It had lost its sort of like right focus, and I just, what state? California. Okay. Yeah. Where'd you go to jail? Where were you in jail? Placer. Okay. So yeah. you were in state prison? No, county jail. Uh, oh. AB one hundred nine. So they sentenced me to state prison. Right. But because I qualified. I'm not unlike you, you you meet all these meters, right. nonviolent offense, sure. less than 500k, right. less than a thousand pounds. So it's uh, AB 109. So I had no paper when I got out. I could go anywhere, do anything. No parole, no probation. I see. That, but I, I had have, to I do have, my time in a county facility, right? Which is terrible. Awful. I mean, county jail is considered uh, that's considered hard time. Yeah, because there's was, no facilities, there's no education, there's nothing. no... I actually took a GED class, which is how I shaved four days off my sentence. I mean, I have a college degree, but right. I just went to the class. Anything to shorten the, right. the time. And, and so I, yeah, so my same thing. Like I, the parole board, I mean, the, the judge sentenced me to what was called an indeterminate five-year sentence. And then the parole board actually gives you a time goal. Recommendation. Based yeah. on your crime, your previous criminal history, which I didn't have one. I had a minor juvenile delinquent thing, but nothing that was really on my record. Um, uh, so based on my previous um, criminal history and what the, the crime was, uh, possession of a controlled dangerous substance with intent to distribute, I was given a 12-month time goal that I could work off three months for. And, uh, and then um, I got an extra five weeks off for good behavior. And, and, uh, and uh, to be perfectly honest, because I had a friend who had two friends who had fathers who had done political work with the president of the New Jersey Parole Board. And they actually let me out five weeks early so that I could start the fall semester of college. Um, which, because it was on the quarter system at Evergreen right. up in Olympia, Washington, school started on, on on September 25th. It started late, right? They let me out of jail on September 23rd. I flew Ooh. to Olympia on the 24th. Um, uh, uh, maybe school started on the 26th. Yeah, on the 25th, we had Jay gets out of jail party. <laughs> and then on the 26th, Monday, I started school is what that was. Yeah. I think it was like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So, you know, I, and they, they pulled for strings sure. for me and they wrote letters for me. And Same. because I had a, and because I had a clean record while I was in jail, listen, everybody in jail, they wanted to tattoo me. They wanted me to smoke weed. They wanted me to, you know, they asked if I wanted blowjobs. I mean, every, you know, like sure. I, did, I did, you know, <laughs> everything that I could do to just, you yeah. know, be straight oh, and narrow. Yeah. I was the biggest um, I mean, square in and, there. And, of all. And, but we did do things to fuck with the system, you know, like for instance, um, uh, we insisted that the prison let me and the one other Jewish guy in the jail have a Passover Seder. And so we contacted the Rabbinical College of America, which was 20 miles away, and they brought us a Passover package. You know, but we just yeah. did it, like, not because we're, like, these hardcore Jews. We just did it to fuck with the system. Yeah, I got a kosher you know? diet for the same reason. My mom got our rabbi to write a letter to uh-huh. the jail to say that I needed a kosher diet just so I could eat a little better. Right, so I, <laughs> was, they, didn't, they didn't have shit like that when I was there, but I was a vegetarian the entire time I was in jail. And so I traded my meat for overcooked canned yep. vegetables, right? Yep. So hot trays of meat, you can get. A good, oh yeah, good. The, people love my meat. Let yep. me tell you, <laughs> they, they were all about my meat. Okay. But a hot tray is it's it, it's commerce, you know. Yeah, it was all Jolly commerce. Ranchers, ramen. Did you ever see a movie called The Longest Yard with sure, Burt Reynolds? Do you, do you remember um, uh, uh, what was the guy's name? Caretaker or something like that. He could get anything. Got, yeah. Burt, got Burt Reynolds laid in jail, mm-hmm. right? You know, he could get you anything. Get you a steak dinner. He, you know, like. Like we did shit like that. We smuggled stuff out of the storeroom. I had a job in the storeroom. I made a dollar ten a day, one dollar and ten cents per day. And we smuggled white sugar out and had a whole black market of white sugar because everybody's addicted to something right. in jail. And so they would yeah. put thirty tablespoons of white sugar in their morning for coffee the for the jolt, that yep. rush, like drinking a Red Bull today or whatever, right? And so we had a black market going with white sugar. They had like um, five hundred cans, big. F- five pound cans of um, government issued grade A peanut butter 
Yeah. Just peanuts. No sugar, nothing. Good, grade A peanut butter. They never once fed it to us in the jail. We were smuggling five pound those cans out, a can a day, and spreading it out in the whole prison and yeah. selling it on the black market, you know. And Did uh, you guys do spreads where you would, you know, come together and cook with like noodles and different well, sauces? Well, so, like... so because I was a drug offense, I was in a drug rehab program. Okay. And so we... Um, uh, I stole a stainless steel ashtray from the drug rehab counselor's office, scrubbed it all out. You were allowed to have an iron to iron your pants, okay? Because wow. you, you were, had to have a good crease, crease in the yeah. middle. <laughs> and we took one of those five-gallon cans of peanut butter or vegetables and that they use for cigarette butts, right? Everybody smoked cigarettes in the dorms, right? Back then. Back then. Yeah. We would flip the iron upside down in the can, put the metal stainless steel ashtray it was a big oversized ashtray I still have it somewhere to, in, to this day right? wow, somewhere what a in my basement right and uh, we would we, I would trade the guys in the kitchen above the storeroom where I worked for raw eggs and, and, and we also had like thousands of pounds of, of grade A government issued cheddar cheese right. in the refrigerator in the storeroom so we'd chop off giant blocks of that and every night we'd fucking make omelets and there was a garden out there with un- tomatoes and oh, scallions wow. So we'd get those guys to bring in the scallions and the tomatoes. We'd get the eggs from the kitchen. We'd get the cheese from me. And every night we'd be making cheese omelets and grilled yeah. cheese sandwiches in the fucking drug rehab program. Hot plate. It's like a de facto hot plate. Hot plate. Hot plate. That's yeah. amazing. We were fucking, we were, it was epic, dude. You People were really resourceful. We were resourceful, yeah. yeah. I got busted. You know, you were allowed to have an iron with a, with an electrical cord, but you weren't allowed to have an electrical cord for your little boom box, you know, your radio okay. cassette player, because we were allowed to have those. When, when you're, when you're, Parents bought it from you at the store. There was no online mail order. Right? They'd right. buy it and it had to be shipped from the store directly, directly to, you. to you. And then they, we would open in the storeroom. My job was to open it and remove the electrical cord that came with it, right? Because they didn't want anybody choking anybody. So we had a storage room that had like thousands of electrical cords in it. So we used to just give them to people. So I had one on my radio with the cord tucked under a bunch of postcards that were taped to my wall. And I come home from work one day and this this prison guard's like, what the fuck is this, Blakesburg? And he's holding up my, my cord. I'm like, I don't know. He's like, I found it attached to your radio. I'm like, never seen it. You know, and he's yeah. like fucking with me. I'm fucking with him. And then finally goes, okay, you have two choices. He goes, you can cut your hair, crew cut, right? Or you can scrub the bathroom with a, to- with a toothbrush. I said, give me the toothbrush. Yeah, I'm not fucking cutting my hair. I'm that. Fucking, I scrubbed that shower <laughs> for three hours. I'm scrubbing that yeah. fucking shower. He finally said, all right, you're done. You know, and he was like, respect that and, and he was like this, you know, 22 year old kid who wanted to be a state trooper. That was his goal in life, but he was a correctional officer, yeah. which is like the lowest of Bottom the low. Wrong, you know? start somewhere. So anyway, but you know, many, 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 many stories yeah. like that in jail. I mean, I, you was know, was it really racialized in there? When I was in there, race relations were really tight and especially me being white and a Jew, I was kind of like in my own world, like what they called so other. So in, when I was in jail, if, if, if somebody could, if I could protect you, better than you could protect me, you became a son. Right, right. So I was a son to a whole bunch of people that really liked me, a couple of Latino fucking gang members and a couple of uh, a couple of African-American guys, black guys, and they liked me and so nobody would fuck with me because I was their son, right? Because I was a fucking weirdo, right? right? So I'm growing my hair long. My father is smuggling alfalfa sprout seeds into jail and I'm sprouting them and they're putting them on their tuna fish and they've never seen alfalfa sprouts before. I had like half the fucking prison population sprouting alfalfa sprouts in their yeah. lockers. You're dangerous. Right? You're so, dangerous to the, the right, system. <laughs> right. And so like, they, you know, like they loved me. And so, and so if somebody tried to fuck with me, these guys would get in the middle of it and they'd be like, no, this is my son. Don't fuck with my son. You know, right. like they wanted to put, I'm a juggler. Right, I used to be a professional juggler. Another little-known fact wow, about me. That's great. And so I used to juggle in jail, and then my nickname was the Juggler in Jail. And and uh, they and they wanted to put like a giant juggler tattoo on my back. But if you get caught with a fresh tattoo, right, more you get time. you get more time because you're defacing government property. Right, because they own own you. They the own time. you. They yeah. own you. So I didn't get a tattoo, but you know, but 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 you know, there's all sorts of fucking crazy yeah. shit. But you know, let's move on. Yeah, from we jail. can move there's, on. I mean, so much, yeah. so much crazy stuff. But I, but I survived, and I walked yeah. out of jail, and I didn't get raped physically, mentally, or spiritually, and I was only in there for eight months, and so I look at it like um, another part of my anthropological journey. I wish I had a camera in there. Um, uh, you know, a few, uh, five, seven, eight years ago, I contacted the prison and said, I want to come there and spend three days in your prison and do a photography workshop and teach people skills. 
And the prison warden said, that's a great idea. I'd love to have you, but you have to go through the state office down in Trenton. The public affairs official contacted them. I wrote him a physical letter that he opened and called me within five minutes again. I'm like, my name is Jay. I was in your prison 30 years ago. This is who I am. This is what I've done. This is what I want to give back. He was all about it, and they never let me do it. They never let me go. Like, when I was in jail, they would walk around with a Polaroid camera, and they would take Polaroids, and you have to give them a dollar out of your canteen budget, to, right. and then you'd send those home to your family, and that was a way to stay connected to your family. I saw you posted a couple <clears throat> right? of those once, and, you uh, and the homies. Yeah, and, and so, um, you know, we were allowed to, to do that, and I said, I will come there and I will do a photograph of every single prisoner in your prison, and I will send prints to them at my co- at my expense. I will pay for it, and they can send them to their families to connect to their families. They turn me down, like you know, unbelievable, right? I've I was willing forbid. to give like a. I said I will lecture in your gym to as many people as you want about my career and what I've done from when I was in yeah. your prison thirty years ago to where I am now. I will do an inspirational slideshow storytelling presentation because I've done that in high schools and colleges, right? And I do my Grateful Dead slideshow. Right. And I will do a select group of, of 10 to 20 prisoners and teach them the art and skill of photography over a three-day period at my expense. I'll stay in a hotel. I'll do this. You know, I'm not like, I'm giving back and they fucking wouldn't let me do it, you know? So... And Heaven forbid you give them some happiness. Or, right, or you know, give them some skills to learn right. so when they get out of jail, they can, they, right. they can maybe do something with their yeah, life. Other than know? go back to jail. Other than go back to jail. So yeah. um, so I walked out of that place, you know, uh, a better person. I've never sold drugs since. You know, I've never Same. I've never even smoked pot since I got oh, out wow. of jail. I, mean, I haven't smoked pot in 40 years. I got out of jail in 1980. I, got, I haven't smoked pot since I got arrested. So I haven't smoked pot since April 11th, 1981. That's impressive. Okay. You know, I've microdosed. Yeah. You know, people said, do you want to microdose? But I don't touch it. I don't go near it. Like, you know, like, I, I don't, I, I can't, you know, right. I can't risk any of that. You know, like I've been at places, you know, where people are like, hey, do you want to try? And I've done that a couple of times, you know. Right. But, um, uh, but in general. You had your run too. And yeah. you also learned your yeah, lessons. Yeah. I mean, after actually, after I got out of jail, the first, the first five years out of jail, six years out of jail, I dosed a lot. But didn't smoke pot, didn't do any other drugs, but I did psychedelics pretty regularly for about six years. And then I stopped and then didn't do it for over 20 years. Yeah. And then I, since then I've microdosed a handful of times. Yeah. I I had a terrible experience my second time taking LSD. Uh, it was the night they played Unbroken Chain for the first time in Philly, which uh-huh. is my favorite song, still is. Um, and I had, you know, short version is I had a great experience my first time. So I thought it would be fine. Just dose and head over to the show and I uh, got really terrified I gave away my ticket stayed outside and uh, and that was know, the show they played on the show they played on broken and for did the you first time. and you've never dosed since I didn't for 13 years uh-huh. and now it's a very special occasion kind of thing right but rarely but I'll do it you know right. like burning man or right. some kind of yeah. cool show you know yeah that's same with me like I've, you know? I've had I, I've had to be somewhere yeah where somebody offered it and to I didn't me. even have like a come to Jesus moment like I said no 200 times in a row and right. on the 200 first time for whatever reason I said sure right yeah um, yeah 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 I wanted to uh, turn back you'd mentioned how you never joined the fish cult so I had this memory because like I started to see fish uh, 122894 again waning years of the dead I'm um, in high school you know and somebody's gave me the riff CD and next thing I know I went to a show and then another show I ended up going to college in Burlington and fish Got it. Shaped my life for many years. Sure. And uh, I remember that that time, you know, 94, 95, dead, Jerry dies, the big transition. There was attitudes from deadheads that were older than I were not interested. Uh, they didn't like fish. They were, in essence, hated it and rejected it. Yet, I've noticed in the ensuing years, maybe with the cherry being Trey doing fairly well, there that there's been sort of a copacetic coalescing of the cultures and torch passing. And I know you've shot fish a lot, and and you you know, what is your recollection of that changing of the guard? Were you on that sort of militant fuck them side? No, never, never. Um, So I had an assistant that worked for me back in the mid '90s, who is uh, ten years younger than me, and he loved fish. And that's why I, I, he'd always like, you got to come see fish. They're great. You know, and I always just like, you know, I just couldn't, I was still just involved. Uh, also at that time, 
in the in the mid '90s, pre you know, while Jerry was still alive, like I was losing interest in the Grateful Dead because they sucked. Right. Like, essentially, I, the Vince I mean, years. I mean, they didn't suck, but they were had some rough patches. Sure. Ninety three, ninety four, ninety five. I mean, there were some moments that were great. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to say the band sucks because I love them. Um, I mean, the proof but, is in the tape. But I was building a career as a freelance photographer, so I was interested in shooting, you know, Nirvana and Pearl Jam, or Nirvana was Kurt was dead at that point, but had shot, you know, starting the late eighties, early nineties, I was shooting. Soundgarden and Stone Temple Pilots and trying to get magazine covers and and working for magazines and working for record companies and nobody get, gave a shit about the Grateful Dead, right? Right, and so and from what I could tell, nobody really gave a shit about Fish in the mainstream media, right? Right, and so I'm trying to make a living, so I'm shooting Susie and the Banshees and Radiohead and you know and and, and what years that Radiohead? Uh, that, wow, that Radiohead is ninety five, um, right? So there you go. Yeah. There's a, we're looking at a picture of Radiohead on my wall. And so that's uh, April of 95, taken here in San Francisco behind Slim's on, on, yeah. on 11th Street. And uh, um, that was what my focus was because I was trying to figure out how to make a living, but I still loved photographing the Grateful Dead and I would still photograph fish if I had the opportunity, but I wasn't chasing them around. I mean, I, I've never, ever in my life, I mean, and listen, I know a lot of people that are like, nah, I'm not a big fan. I don't get it. I can't, I don't get Trey's guitar. I love fucking fish. I love Trey. But you just didn't join the cult. <laughs> no, I just didn't go all in because right. I was already like, I was, I had, I was having kids, right? I made yep. my first kid in 94. Uh, my second kid in 96, both my kids, big fish heads, you know, they're going to New Year's, you know, Halloween, Dicks, yeah. Dicks, you know, yeah. Atlantic City, you know, whatever. <clears throat> um, so it was more the timing wasn't right. I had young kids. I was still okay. shooting The Grateful Dead. I was traveling. I was shooting all these other bands. Um, I was trying to make a living. Um, I just wasn't going to jump on the road and just go start seeing about, you know, fish and start following them around. Uh, in 99, I was asked to shoot those shows at the Warfield with Trey and Paige and Phil yeah. by Fish's Camp. They hired me. They were aware of me. I had done some magazine stuff. In 96, I did a shoot with Trey and Paige, mostly Trey and the band, <clears throat> on stage in Phoenix. My wife was from Phoenix. We were there for Thanksgiving. They were playing the big arena there. Um, uh, their tour manager was a deadhead. He knew my work of the Grateful Dead, so he kind of opened, you know, Brad Sands, yeah, who now sure. manages Primus, Primus. and 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 uh, Mickey from Ween, and you know, co-manages. He manages Ween. Ween, yeah, 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 co-manages okay. Ween, yeah, of course, yeah. and uh, you know, a bunch of other stuff as well. And uh, you know, so he kind of invited me into that with open arms, but. Again, I just wasn't going all in. And right. then uh, Jason Colton, the band's manager now, you know, uh, when they did that big festival in 99 in Oswego, yeah, I which I there. guess is just called Oswego, yeah. he called me up and said, we, need, we want to hire you to do this. You know, it was after okay. I did that. Jason had hired me for the... Um, Warfield. Warfield, and, and just for a couple nights there. Or, or actually, he, he hired me for one night. And, uh, and then I did, did that. And then, you know, I became kind of the fish photographer yeah. for, until the hiatus. Yeah, and um, uh, and it was different back then. Like you know, the, it was sort of almost pre-internet, pre-social media. Yeah. not pre-internet, but pre, you know, the beginning of digital photography yeah. a little bit. Um, Were you still shooting film? I was still shooting film and shooting some digital. They had a girl on tour shooting some digital for their digital needs, which were very minimal at that point. Maybe some web website stuff. I can't right. remember. And uh, but I would just you know like it was special stuff. Like I'd go shoot an Alpine show, or I'd go shoot the Vegas run. I'd go shoot a Red Rocks run. Like, it wasn't like I was on tour with them. I it, remember seeing you on you stage know, shooting fish. Back so, then. yeah, so I would shoot, and Taylor Crothers would shoot, and like we were sort of like, and Danny Clinch would shoot. Like, we were like the fish photographers, yeah. and we would drop in sporadically and do stuff here and there. Like, I did the Shoreline 99 stuff, and they needed a new publicity photo, so they, we did a big band portrait of them with all the, all the road cases. Uh, so, you know, like it was, I do Shoreline, I do Vegas, I do West Coast, I do this, I do that, you know, but it was, but it I was... It came a, at you through work, it sounds like. You're getting calls from management. You're not, yes. hey, I want to go to the show, no, I'll bring my camera. Correct. Okay. 100%, yeah. And then, uh, and then when they came back from the hiatus, um, they, they needed to mix it all up, you know, right. they needed a change of guard. So I stopped shooting for them and Taylor stopped. They tried some different photographers and they eventually landed on Renee, who they use now, who's right. awesome. You know? Yeah, and Jake Silko. I think. And Jake has right. been getting stuff. Jake, was, Jake yeah. was doing some of the Trey stuff, and now he's doing a little bit of the fish stuff. I love there. to see the evolution, yeah. and everybody shoots it different, and it all has merit, you know? It's funny you brought up about the fill-in and friends with Trey and Paige. That's such a landmark 
sh- run for the bridging of the worlds. Oh, yeah. In real time, you know, what was, what was your takeaway from that? Was that oh, mind-blowing? Like mind-blowing. Yeah. Mind-blowing. Yeah. Trey and Steve Kimmock together right. with Phil. I mean, and Paige and Molo. I mean, come on. Yeah. Mind-blowing. 40-minute bio yeah. to kick it off. Yeah. It's like, are you kidding yeah. me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, you know, and I regret not coming the third night, you know, yeah. because I was like, you know, they're like, you don't need to come and shoot. You know, you're good. You got plenty. And I'm like, okay, my wife wanted to do something. And I'm like, what was I thinking, you know? Right. I went too nice, so. Well, yeah, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, career stuff that I wanted to touch on. Really, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I know, you know, you shot for Rolling Stone and Relics. Journalism has evolved a lot. Um, to how have you navigated or surfed the wave, the shifting of the guard? You mentioned the internet and social media, film to digital. Um, obviously, you have iconic images that you own. But in the current, you know, context of being a rock photographer um how have you pivoted and to to thrive in the internet social media era right so you know the kids that are out there shooting today that are let's say anywhere from 20 to 35 years old they grew up with a computer they've never shot film they've only known digital photography maybe um uh they're very tech savvy like it was a big learning curve you know, when we, uh, I mean, I guess we're at least 20 years into a, you know, uh, uh, let me think about this. Yeah, a little bit less than 20 years, about 20 years since we sort of started to scan images. Uh, the beginning of the digital revolution, uh, I started to scan my photos. I was shooting film and then scanning prints or negatives and then eventually moved into shooting digital um, so yeah, huge learning curve, um, and, uh, an important lear- learning curve. And a lot of people that are my age or older don't really understand that learning curve or understand that process. You know, they, they just never, they never were able to make that transition. Uh, I've embraced social media. I joined Facebook in 2008, uh, specifically because I was putting out a book that I self-published called Traveling on a High Frequency. It was a career retrospective, 1978, 2008. And, um, uh, but I had already done my first book in 2001, I started, and that was my Grateful Dead book, Between the Dark and Light. Yep, I've got it. And, uh, and that book gave me the book bu- book making bug. And then I did a Primus book uh, that's a limited edition. I did it with the band, signed by Les, signed by me. Um, printed too many of them. Printed, I think, 2,500 copies. Um, they've been trickling out the door. It's funny, I did a Primus podcast last year, and we sold a bunch yeah. You know, which is great. I actually only am down to about the last 200 copies of that book now. So it's almost almost gone. It'll be right. it'll 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 be sold out in a, within a year, I think. Um, and uh, then I did a book with the Flaming Lips. Uh, that was super limited, right? Yes. If I remember correctly. Like 1500 copies. Yeah. Like I think last time I looked on eBay, I saw one for about 800 bucks. Wow. Um, do you do you have any of those? Still? I do have about six or seven or eight okay. of those left if, if Blakesburg.com uh, Blakesburg.com yeah they're not I don't think they're listed on my website you gotta email me but Blakesburg.com okay. yeah it. if you want that Flaming Lips book there's six or seven of them left and and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sell to you for $800 but All I'll right. sell to you for a couple hundred bucks um, noted and uh, um, Hippie Chick was Hippie Chick uh, but uh, but before Hippie Chick and before Jam was traveling on high frequency okay and I just, you know, and so I started making books and started really expanding, you know, the quality of what we were scanning on film, uh, traveling on our frequencies, my first book that has some digital photos in it, along with mostly film. And uh, so that was, so I started, I got on Facebook to market that book. I think I had 800 friends on Facebook when traveling on a high frequency came out. You know, I've got 80,000 right. followers or something like that now on Facebook. And a lot of them are deadheads. And so I definitely, you know, if you follow Bob Weir on social media, sure, like he's been using a lot of my stuff all year yeah. because I've been feeding them a lot of my work. They've asked me if I would share my work with, with him to be able to use for social media. And like Bob's been very generous with me. So I'm, he's let me photograph him for 40 years. Right. So I'm, yes, of course, here. And, uh, you know, and, but I get, you know, I get something out of it. People become aware of me and my work and I get more followers, which hopefully turns into... Um, you know, putting my marketing hat on, you know, people buying my books because that's how I make a living. I sell books and I still do photography, but you know, like I don't shoot nearly as much these days as I did in the nineties. Right. Uh, photography is a young person's game. The art directors are younger. The photo editors are younger. The band managers are younger. They want to work with, you know, they want to work with 
people that are 25 years old or right. 28 years old, not somebody who's 60 years old, you know? And some of them love working with me because I think that I'm still making good photographs, yeah. you know? Like, I don't think that I'm like the old guy who they're laughing at and saying, fuck, man, he can't shoot anymore. No. Um, no. Plus, uh, there's cachet that comes with a Jay Blakesburg session. Sure. You know? Sure. Especially for a younger band. Yeah, but, I mean, but I've done portrait sessions with Goose, Twiddle, Pigeons, Spafford. Yeah. That's a- on my list, the a- baby band. Aqueous. You're, you love the baby band. Yeah, gentlemen. I love them. I, yeah. I love, I'm a fucking hippie. I love all that music. I yeah. lo- and I love becoming friends with those guys. And I think that their their music is fucking stellar, you know. Yeah. Like I love. I know you like the works too. Yeah, I love the works also. Yeah, yeah. they're great. Um, but you know, so I've photographed those bands on stage, and some of them off stage. Like all of those bands I just mentioned, I've done portraits of them off stage. You know, right. um, Aqueous, Spafford, Pigeons, Goose. Um, you know, I saw Goose for the first time. I've been hearing about Goose. But I saw yeah. him for the first time when they did playing in the sand, and I was like, "I'm in, I'm hooked." Like, yeah, they've come got on. a wave right now. Oh, they're, they're fucking they're crushing rolling. it. You know, yeah. uh, 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 Peter, you know the keyboard guitar the player. Um, he came out here to visit a, a, a girlfriend of his a couple months ago. We had lunch together, and I said, "Do you want a, a t- you and a girlfriend want a, a historical tour of the Haight Ashbury?" And I took them to the Haight and walked them around the Haight for an hour and a half and showed them 710 Ashbury and the Jefferson Airplane House on Fulton. I love that. Told them where 1090 Page was, where Janis Joplin and Big Brother started. And, you know, talked about, you know, the the venues and the Haight Theater and, and, and the significance of 710 Ashbury and the significance of the scene and... You know, we went down to the Panhandle and showed them where Hendrix played on in June of '67, and the Dead That's played. In the pan, you know, gave them a whole. Hit, they loved it. Can't get put a price on that kind of. Yeah. Uh, so, and I've done that. A, I actually, my friend uh, Vinny, who's the drummer in the band Mo. Sure. Amico, was, Amico, Amico, Vinny Amico, right. a good friend of mine. Him and his family stayed here back in this in the summer. Um, uh, for a couple of nights they were on like a family vacation I was like you guys want to go do a historical tour of the hate and I gave him one also Amazing. and his family and you know so it's fun I love doing it because I know all that history you know so uh, um, so if you're ever out here in the Bay Area any of you folks you know give me a holler and we'll do a historical tour um, but yeah so uh, but I love those bands and I love shooting them and I think that they're unbelievable and, I, and of course you know and if there's Panic and Umphreys and Mo and, and String Cheese and right. Fish which are all sort of like you know if the Grateful Dead are the, the first you know the, the main trunk of the tree they were the first branches right. to come off of it and now these next wave of bands and then there's the funk bands and right. you know but you look at Widespread Panic or you look at String Cheese you look at these bands that do you know uh, two sets and they do a first set that's maybe some shorter songs and they get go deep in a second that's all the, the roots blueprint. of the Grateful Dead yeah. you know doing a, a 12 night Baker's Dozen Run at the Garden that's a that's all the yeah. roots of the Grateful Dead and you know Kunj I mean, and I were just talking about that the other who? day Kunj Kunj uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Um, he owns Live for Live Music yeah of course no, uh, we're friends stuff, yeah but... of course oh right you've shot, you've shot I'm sure a ton of his yeah uh, so, um, but we were talking about how the blueprint for the dead thing has just infiltrated everywhere, everywhere. You know, a, 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 you know, doing a residency, doing a yeah. whole Northwest run, but doing a Northwest run where, or or a West Coast run where there's two hundred people going to every show. Right. You know, that comes from the Grateful Dead. Yeah. You know, a fish run, whatever it is. Like, there's all this stuff that comes from those roots. Right. And, and I love every minute of it. You know, Dean Budnick from, from Relics. Relics, you know, coined yeah. the term jam bands. You know, when we were seeing the Grateful Dead, there was the Grateful Dead and the Allman Brothers. Right. And that was it. There were no jam bands. No, there were right. no jam bands. There was psychedelic music. Lots right. of it. Yeah. But there were no jam bands. <clears throat> you know, I mean, I used to go to Dead shows in the late 80s and bring mm-hmm. a Sony Walkman cassette player and put Talking Heads Remain in Light in. And listen to it at set break when I was tripping, <laughs> <clears throat> because it's fucking psychedelic, you know. Yeah. Well, I met David Byrne once, <clears throat> several times to do a photo shoot with him, and I was like, I'm like, you know, and I told him that story. He's like, I'm like, Remain in Light is like the most psychedelic record ever. He's like, really? I did not know that, you know. Right, but so, now it's been so embraced by the the culture. I would listen yeah. to that, and people would be like, "What are you listening to?" And I'd be like, "Here," and I put the headphones on, and they'd be like, "Whoa." Yeah. These were in the Whoa. days when Deadheads only listened to the Dead. Right. 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 Yeah. We had tunnel vision. Yeah. And I. It, and now people have big ears. Deadheads are listening yeah. to Snoop and Dre and Wiz Khalifa and and, and, sure. and Funk and Galactic and the Meters and the Nevels and you know the, it, you know you hit it right there. The Nevels are the bridge. The Nevels are another bridge. You know yeah, between the the Funk I, and yeah, New Orleans thing and the Dead thing. I got turned on to the Nevels when I was in college. A guy I worked for was the first person to turn me on to the Neville Brothers. A guy named Chris Nelson. Um, I worked for Chris, and so Chris Nelson 
he was the first person I ever heard mention the Neville brothers. That was probably 84, right? So even late to the game for that, yeah. even knowing who the Neville brothers were. Um, this you know, before I, they started opening for the dead. Yeah, and then they start, then they then I became aware of them and shot yeah. them and whatnot. But uh, I didn't start listening to the Nevilles until the mid '80s, um, and that's probably when I learned about the Meters. But I didn't know the backstory and the history of the Meters, you know, like and and all of that stuff. You know, the all the studio session musicians in L.A. and the backup singers, all those documentaries that have come out over the last ten years. You know, a lot of people didn't know those stories, right. and I consider myself definitely very knowledgeable about the history of rock but you learn that stuff over time you know so when i in 84 you know i was 20 something years old and you know i still had tunnel vision and knew the grateful dead and you know was learning about peter gabriel and the talking heads i started learning about them in 82 yeah 82 when i started learning about stuff like that right. and you know started expanding what i but again it's just people turning you on to that kind of music right yeah um, so, you know, like a Peach Festival this year when Turquoise did that thing with Adrian Blue and right. Jerry, Harris, Jerry Harrison. I mean, it was unbelievable. Yeah. I put my camera down after a while and just started dancing. It was Can't so wait to see that at Halloween. You know, yeah, I mean, I'm just yeah. jealous that I, I'm dying to see them. They're again. an incredible ensemble, Turquoise, just yeah. in general, but yeah. add those guys. Oh, uh, with Adrian Blue. I, I mean, wait. I'm a huge Adrian Blue fan. Yeah. I have been. Crimson. Yeah, yeah. The, all, those, all the, those three Crimson records, the red, blue, and yellow one, you know, and three of a perfect pair, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, discipline, and what's the third one? Um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. I know, uh, but vaguely. all those all those records were just phenomenal, yeah. and 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 it's interesting because there was all this cross pollination between those bands. You know, David Bowie. You know, Brian Eno produced the Talking Heads, yeah. and Brian Eno produced David Bowie, and Brian Eno worked with Robert Fripp, who was in the King Crimson. Who you know, Fripp and Eno made records together. Who then connects to Adrian Ballou, who is in the Talking Heads, and Brian Eno produced He's like Kevin the, Bacon. You know, all of it. Yeah. right. It's just like you know, and so it's weird, like you know. And then of course there's Peter Gabriel, and Peter Gabriel worked with you know this musician, and, and you know Tony Levin, who was also in King Crimson, who's right. connected to Adrian Ballou, and right, and all those bands in the early '80s, the Bowie, Fripp, Eno. Talking Heads, David Byrne, it was all like what's going on with these jam bands right. where people are sitting in or, or like what happened with the Grateful Dead in the early 70s when David Crosby and Graham Nash lived here in the Bay Area and you go down to Wally Hyder and the airplane were recording in one room and right. Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young were recording in the next and the Grateful Dead are making American Beauty in the next and they're all sitting in and Garcia sits in on Teacher Children right. you know and makes it you know, the metal steel with you know yep. becomes you know a, a huge hit and, and then you know then Paul Kantner says, I'm going to do the rock, you know, I'm going to do rock and roll planet earth orchestra and make blows against the empire and Garcia and Lesher on that with, with, you know, David Crosby right. and Joni Mitchell. And it's like all this stuff that was going on here, which again happened again, like, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s with Jackie Green and the mother hips and right. Mickey Bloom and T leaf green. And um, uh, I'm sure I'm, blanking on a number of different bands, you know, that sort of were this Bay Area, Americana, psychedelic scene. Yep. scene Came out of like high Sierra culture. Yeah, like that yeah. whole culture, you know. And so it, 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 it's interesting to see these bands cross-pollinate. Yeah. And I love that, you know, Reed Mathis, who, you know, oh, yeah. touches, Jacob you know, Fred, you know ALO. ALO is another band that's right. part of that whole scene, right. you know. So so there's, you know, J you know, Reed Mathis plays with Billy, Billy Kreutzman, but he's also kids, played right. with, you know, Bob Weir, he's sat in with, and he's also plays with Jacob Fred, like you're saying, and then and he the was wingman, and he was in Tea Leaf Green, and then he's the wingman, which is J.K. and Further, and then Jay yep. Lane and Rat Dog and Further, and you know Weir Wasserman, and you know it's all this stuff, and all. it all yeah. somehow connects back to the good old to the Grateful, OGs. yeah, to yeah. the Grateful Dead. It's amazing, and it I is. love every minute of it, and I love documenting, and then you get a band like Primus who starts out in the beginning of their career and everybody thinks they're a heavy metal, thrash right. metal, funk band. But Larry is a huge deadhead. Larry's a huge... I used to see dead, Larry at dead yep. shows. Huge deadhead. Yeah. You know? But he did guitar lessons for Joe Satriani, who's not a deadhead. Who you've worked with Yes, of many times. we got to do another one. I have so many... we got to do another interview, like, in a year or two. Sure. And touch on the Satriani and the Santana. So, okay, so... Primus so, so, so I'm gonna, uh, if we're getting to the end of this, I'm going to plug a few things. Please do. I wanted so, to ask about the Retro Blakesburg okay. IG page. Okay, so... Let's, let's talk about Retro Blakesburg. So Retro Blakesburg is a page, which is funny. My daughter was just texting me about it while we were on this, doing this podcast interview. And she says, I need a good retro photo. I want something new. Send me something. So, um, or choices. So my daughter curates that page 100%. Um, a month into the pandemic, she came to me and said, I want to start a new Instagram page. Um, 
she originally was going to do like a retro fashion page and she did it for like two days. And mm. then she's like, I have an idea. I want to do a thing called Retro Blakesburg. And the premise behind Retro Blakesburg, and that's what it is on Instagram, at Retro Blakesburg. And then I have my own Instagram page, which is at J Blakesburg that I do and I right. curate. Retro Blakesburg is only photographs that I shot on film. Oh, wow. There's no digital photographs on there. Only shots on film. And she curates. And she, she cur- and she curates it. She does everything. She'll ask me for information about photos, and then she write, rewrites it because she's posting everything. So, like, sometimes people think I'm posting it or direct messages to me, but she's the one doing it. So then about six or eight months ago, she said to me, can we do a Retro Blakesburg coffee table book? And I said, yes. And that's what we're working on right now. Wow. And it's about 90% done. Same um, rules? Film only? Film only. She's curating it. She's writing the captions I'm too? writing the captions. Okay. I'm writing, which I need to finish. I have about 80 pages of captions to write. Um, so that book will come out next year. Um, and it's called Retro Blakesburg, um, Volume 1, The Film Archives. And uh, so that's a project that's in the works and probably be my next big, biggest thing to come out. <clears throat> I'm also doing a documentary film with my son, which we don't even have a title for. We just delivered our first solid, real cut to our executive producers and our, our big team that's going to hopefully get this thing in theaters or on Netflix or Showtime or HBO or Amazon or something like that. And that film is about deadheads and how you fall in love with the Grateful Dead and how the Grateful Dead has persevered through five decades or seven decades or whatever it is, you know, getting close to six decades, yeah. I should say. Um, and made it through the disco Crazy. thing and made it through like we talked about earlier. And so, and it's also a story about the war on drugs and Reagan and the yuppies and the culture and how this thing survived. But it also weaves part of my story through the whole thing. And we have some great interviews by like Mickey Hart and Dave Schools have some really incredible interviews in there. Sweet. And a bunch of deadheads. And um, hopefully that will come out in 2022. Um, but we are very far along on that documentary. Um, we're going to we have a big conference call coming up this week, and we're going to get feedback and figure out how to tweak this thing and make it even better. It's right got on. a lot of B-roll in it. It's got a lot of photography in it. There's still a lot of hurdles we have to overcome because it's very expensive to license video footage sure. and, and, and publishing. From We have Grateful Dead music yeah. in it. We have to get approval from them to use it. Are you doing narration? or? Uh, I was interviewed, and okay. other people were or, but, but There's like, no narration. Okay. It's all interviews. Gotcha. All interviews. So we have, a, we have a ways to go on that project because we still have to clear all this um, intellectual property yeah, that's owned by stuff. other people. So um, working on that. Um, I'm working on another book on the history of blotter acid art. I love it. Um, with a guy here in San Francisco who has a large collection. He uh, His thing is called the Institute of Illegal Images. And uh, he has a very big collection of blotter art. And so I'm working on a book with him that will come out next year. Um, I am working on a book on psychedelic icons that I have photographed. Um, that was supposed to come out now but covid put a pinch in that because right. my writer got sick with covid and Ooh. became a long hauler and That's so tough. she's still struggling and getting better so we're gonna hopefully get back to that and put that book out is that the same partnership as hippie chick yeah same woman who wrote hippie chick okay what's her name edith johnson right most incredible human being that i know and 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 incredible writer How's she doing with the covid It'd she's hanging in there she's getting okay. better Good. she's doing yoga and she's out of bed and walking but it's you know it's real the struggle is real. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So, um, anyway, so I've had, I got that book project going on. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And then, you know, still shooting. Still shoot some festivals and sh- still shoot Dead and & Co. And, and uh, you know, Bobby stuff and Phil stuff and Billy stuff and Mickey stuff. and. Yeah. And, uh, they keep you working. Yeah, keep, and you know, work with you know Pete Shapiro and and his organization and and Brooklyn Bowl and Capitol yeah. Theater and Lockin and and uh, so that's what that's what's on my the plate. The future is bright. I've got I got projects going on. Yeah, I'm working you on do. some pop up photo galleries for some for some events. Yeah, let me know about um, any of that. Stuff. I do you know I, I do tours where I lecture and do my Grateful Dead slideshow. Yeah, the slideshow, show, right? So I just did that last this last June. We did six of them, you know, in small music venues, indoors and outdoors. Yeah, you ever um, do it in Ardmore Music Hall in Philly? Yeah, twice. Yeah, done it at the Ardmore twice. Yeah, I was gonna. I worked for Chris for many yeah, years. Yeah, his lo- old room. The they love me at the Ardmore. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I, so. I think I sold it out last time. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out. 
Chris Perella from All the right. Ardmore. It's my boy. Yeah. Yeah. Look, he's, have you seen it since they renovated it? No. Oh, it's beautiful. No. I've seen live streams yeah. from there, but yeah. I haven't been Good inside. Job. Good job. Good it. job at the Ardmore. So we got the uh, Retro Blakesburg coffee table book. That's first. That's going to be next. Yeah. And then behind that, the film with yeah. your son. So my real job is I'm a writer. Uh, this okay. is like a passion project. So okay. when that's coming out, you let me know. We'll do a feature. Maybe talk to your daughter if she wants sure. to talk about it. She we'll will. do a little father-daughter we'll, we'll do Q&A. Press. We will do it. Oh, we'll put okay. me on the list. All right. All right. That sounds good. And we'll do this again down the road when we got some news. I, I, like I said, I got about halfway through my bullet points. Uh-huh. We left a lot on the table. All right. Yeah. So there's a lot, lot. We haven't even talked about shooting... Pearl Jam and yeah. Radiohead and the I Chili I want to hear peppers. about Jane's before they broke up. But, you know, I know you got a lot of stories. Yeah. I really want to hear about Santana and the supernatural wave. Yeah. But that's a 20-minute I shot thing. the back cover I know. of that record. I mean, and changed and, your... And the, yeah. Everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that that's, you know, that, that's a... Love, Carlos. I bet. Yeah. All right, Jay, you've been really generous with your time. And it's very exciting to look around uh, your studio here and see all the work. But uh, where can people find everything that you do if they want to check out your books if they want to see uh how they can get involved with your different events where do they find all things jay blake's so i definitely post a lot on social media uh i love it i love sharing my work i love people connecting to my photographs on that level uh so on instagram at jay blakesburg b-l-a-k-e-s-b-e-r-g on also on instagram at retro blakesburg we just talked about of course uh on facebook i'm jay blakesburg photography i have a personal Facebook page. I don't post anything on it. Um, so go to my Jay Blakesburg photography page. And then if you want to check out any of the books that I've made, uh, the ones that are still available, many of them are sold out, uh, go to my website, which is rockoutbooks.com, uh, www.rockoutbooks.com. And between all those places, you can kind of find all my stuff out there. I do sell prints through different galleries around the country as well as online. So, Morrison Hotel? Uh, Morrison Hotel Gallery right. sells a lot of my stuff. Music Today has a gallery. Uh, uh, there's one in Nashville. I'm working on one in Breckenridge, Colorado with a guy that's opening a, a gallery there. So, you know, you can find my stuff. But yeah, Morrison Hotel Gallery is a great place or even oh, yeah. just my website, rockoutbooks.com has got a bunch of online stuff. And um yeah, and then uh, when I do speaking gigs, I always just post it on social media. Like if I'm going on tour right. and you want to come check out my slideshow, uh, the next ones that I have on board are going to be at Playing in the Sand. Um, cool. I, I do it in a big ballroom there. I have a captive deadhead audience, and we do a 90-minute Grateful Dead slideshow on Friday and Saturday of both weekends. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Cool. We'll put all those links in the show notes so people can just drop down on your podcast player and click away. Right. You can find all Jay's stuff. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, B, and uh, we'll do it again. I look forward to it. All right, cheers. Thank you. Give thanks. Jay Blakesburg. What a just absolutely rewarding conversation with somebody that inspired me so much as a youngster and continues to this day, as you heard. Um, speechless, really hard to put into words what that meant. Just to be invited into his space, into his home, as kids were there milling about. Just a you know, half century of music history, Bay Area centric on the walls, both by his eye and uh, his curated hand as well. He, He displays work of others as well. And he's very humble and also, you know, understands the pivotal role and contribution he has you know, given to the culture and to the history books and to the discourse and to the ether. I mean, I never really imagined 
I would have been invited over there and welcomed in such a way and just reminded of how uniquely ours, this thing of ours, Nicosa Nostra, really is. And the symbiosis between he and I and between he and I and y'all is precisely why we are who we are. And you're hearing those hymns in the background. This is the that one from the vault, Great American Music Hall show that we discussed in there. And of course, one from the vault, just such an iconic and pivotal release for so many of us in hopping in the Wayback Machine with the good old Grateful Dead. And yeah, hard to believe, 50 episodes, first Grateful Dead-centric episode with the great Jay Blakesburg. I suspect... Over the course of the next 50, there might be another one or two. Who knows? I wanted to do it right and and organically and in all good things and all good time, as they say. So that's how I got here. But before I forget, I just want to run back Jay's contact stuff. Blakesburg.com is kind of the hub. It has everything. But of course, he has uh, rock out books and Instagram at J Blakesburg and at Retro Blakesburg, curated by his daughter. And we heard about all the projects they have on the way. So please, you know, follow Jay, go to his events, his slideshows. He's a historian and anthropologist and a fucking hell of a guy. And I'm so honored to be in his orbit now. And I keep my fingers crossed that we do indeed speak again. And who knows where this takes me. Um, just by connecting with such an icon of the, you know, music, media, slash culture, reporter, archivist, archaeologist, ambassador. He is all the things and so much more. Jay Blakesburg, thank you very much. Listeners, thank you. 50 episodes in. I think I'm going to try to do another 50 more. Get up to a hundo and then we'll uh, see what time it is, whenever that is. But I've got a couple more already in the can that I am thrilled about, bubbling with excitement. But first, Halloween this weekend. Can't wait back to get back to the park with the fam. Obviously, huge lettuce set Friday night on the amphitheater stage. I live for that two hours. So you'll hear about that on Live for Live Music uh, in the aftermath of Halloween. Hit me up, b.getz at upfullife.com. I want to hear from you. You know, if you want to hit the patreon.com, that would be amazing. But I'm just happy you're listening in. Patreon.com backslash upfullife. And of course, please subscribe. Smash that subscribe button. And rate and or review this pod if you have the time and are so inclined. But in the meantime, I'm going to play. Jay said summer... Early fall, 1980, his sweet spot. So that's where we're going with it. Springfield, Massachusetts, September 3rd, 1980. Althea, short and sweet example of the magic that Jay was speaking of in that particular tour. And with that, we'll say goodbye. Job less. The Vibe Junkie Jam is on the way. And we'll see you next time.